Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting human evolution research and sharing discoveries in programs like this. We want to thank Anna Gordon Getty and Camille and George Smith, whose generous support has made this episode of Lunch Break Science possible. Here with us today is 2015 Leakey Foundation Baldwin Fellowship Scholar and Leakey Foundation grant recipient, Haile Reda. Uh, Haile, we're so excited to have you here with us today. Thank you for inviting me and hello everyone. Uh, Halai is joining us from the Geometric Morphometrics Lab at the University of Oregon, where he is a, a doctoral student. Um, he'll be talking today about his work um, focused on learning the environments of our ancient ancestors by studying fossil remains of animals. Um, he received his master's degree from Addis Ababa University and was a faculty at Ma'ala University in Ethiopia. Um, before we hear from him though, um, for those of you joining us live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, you can post questions and comments for highlight anytime during the episode and we'll loop back to those questions at the end. The earlier you get those questions in, the uh, more likely they will be asked. So be sure to get them in early. My first question is, um, why are we interested in the environments of our early ancestors? Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, let me start with the modern environment. Uh, as we can see from this slide, the modern environment provides uh, several resources to the animals living in that particular environment. So uh, animals can find their food, they can find their drinking water, and they can also find their sleeping site, as well as the uh, appropriate uh, substrate on which they can, they can move. So if there is a change in the environment, uh, what this means is in one way or another, they can, they can be affected. The animals can be affected because of this change. <clears throat> So it is uh, logical to assume that uh, a similar situation might have, ha might have happened in the early uh, humans. <clears throat> so this uh, graph is showing the uh, environment of early humans in East Africa. Hmm. So we see a general trend of increasing in an open environment. And studies have also provided uh, uh, evidences of appearance and disappearance of, of different early human species. So what this means is that uh, early humans evolved in conjunction with the environmental uh, changes where they lived. Not only uh, the uh, early humans, but also other faunas. So uh, understanding the uh, environment of early humans is providing us the bigger context to understand the evolution of early human ancestors. So, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, they, they, they have been affected by the environmental change, not only early human ancestors, but also other faunas, like uh, uh, the lineage of fossil monkeys were also been, uh, been affected by this change. So since uh, uh, about 4 million to the closer 1 million, this lineage has uh, adapted the environment by uh, changing its morphology. There is a, a general increase in size. There is a general increase in the complexity of, of uh, its tools. So it's becoming more complex and complex so that uh, it, it was able to adapt to the changing environment. So obviously you're not hopping in a time machine and traveling you know, back to see what the environments were like, but um, how, how can you understand what the environment was like just looking at the fossil record? Uh, let me start again with <clears throat> the modern uh, fauna. If we see uh, fauna like in a park or in an open environment, uh, different animals 
uh, prefer different habitats or different uh, environments. <laughs> if you see the slide, in this slide, uh, Colobus Greza is preferring a more wooded environment, whereas the, uh, the, the, the one on the, on the right, which is a baboon, is preferring an open environment. So this is what we really observe in the modern environment. So if we see our fauna, the fossil fauna, we have uh, faunas which prefer uh, different environments. Some of them prefer uh, open environment like the baboon. Some of them prefer a wooded environment like the colobus monkey. So if we uh, analyze the faunal abundance that we have, the fossil faunal abundance that we have, if most of the, the fauna prefer uh, a wooded environment, so this means the environment where they lived was a, uh, an environment uh, dominantly covered by trees. On the other hand, if our fossil faunas predominantly show a preference of open environment, and this means that environment where this fossil faunas lived was dominantly an open environment. And there is an, uh, uh, a very particular example, uh, as you can see in the next slide, that Aramis was uh, uh, dominated highly by colobine uh, fossil monkeys. And colobines are, are commonly known that they prefer a wooded environment. So this suggests that Aramis was uh, a wooded environment. So uh, Aramis is the site where Ardiptecus ramidus was discovered. So uh, indirectly, uh, the environment for Ardiptecus ramidus, commonly known as Ardi, was a wooded environment, an environment that was highly covered by uh, big trees. So this is one, one way to understand uh, the environment of early times or the environment uh, by the time where our early ancestors lived. And we also have another uh, mechanism like uh, using isotope analysis. For this, the assumption is that uh, different plants follow different photosynthesis photosynthesis uh, pathway. What this means is that they have different mechanism to uh, produce their, their food. So big trees follow a C3 photosynthetic pathway, whereas uh, uh, grasses and grass related families follow a C4 photosynthetic pathway. So animals eating on fruits and the leaves show uh, a C3 isotopic signature or a C3 uh, isotope. And uh, animals that dominantly uh, depend for their food on C4 grasses show their isotopic uh, signature, C4 uh, uh, isotopic signature. So if we have fossil faunas that show more of a C3 uh, isotopic signature, what this means is that their diet was dominantly fruits or leaves. And in turn, this suggests that the environment where they live was highly dominated by a, 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 a tree cover. On the other hand, if the fossil fauna that we have show a predominantly C4 uh, isotope signature, what this means is that uh, they were highly dependent for their diet on C4 grasses. And this indirectly suggests that uh, the environment where this fossil fauna lived was mainly an open environment. So this is uh, uh, the, way, the way we uh, we are able to understand ancient environments, but there are also other ways, other mechanisms like uh, colon analysis and also phytolis and uh, isotopic, uh, under isotopic uh, signature of, of uh, paleosol carbonates. So there are different mechanisms to understand the environment of early humans or the environment of uh, ancient uh, time in general. So when you're collecting fossils for the funnel analysis, how much of the identification are you actually doing in the field? Uh, in the first place, before I say the, uh, how much identif identification that we do in the field, uh, I would like to say, what, what are the fossil faunas uh, uh, look like that we find in the field? So uh, mostly the fossil faunas are, uh, are isolated too, because uh, they are, highly resistant to destruction in the uh, process of fossilization. 
So uh, crania and other complete skeletal remains are very rare. Uh, so uh, the, the reason why I, I, I brought this slide is just to, to increase visibility of, of uh, the specimens because tooth or teeth are very tiny, so people might have uh, difficulty of observing the important features. Otherwise, uh, the, 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 uh, the composition of uh, fossils that we have is mainly uh, dominated by isolated tooth. So coming to the identification, uh, in the field, we uh, tentatively identify specimens because uh, the field is mostly done within a short period of time. So uh, there are a lot of rushes, uh, rushes like uh, doing other stuff too, not only identification. So uh, tentative, tentative identification is, was uh, mainly emphasized. So uh, the identification mainly done at higher taxonomic level, not the, the lowest possible taxonomic identification. So here is uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the way we follow uh, to identify fossil specimens in the field. For instance, this, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a cast for a fossil monkey. So this represents a sarcopter sign. Generally, uh, we have uh, fossil monkeys are broadly grouped into sarcopter signs and colobines. So this is a, a specimen of sarcopter sign and it has a, a relatively longer snout and it has a, a, a very relatively narrow uh, interorbital breadth. And we also have uh, important dental or tooth morphology that enable us to identify whether a, the specimen is uh, a sarcopter sign or a colobine. In the first place, if you see the front, the front teeth, they are relatively larger. And the, the molars, the molars are the teeth towards the back of our jaw. So if you see this bumpy like structures, we technically call caspers, they, uh, they, they are having low casp relief compared to the, from, from the level of the, the uh, gorge like structure. So they're uh, not very, prominent caspers. And if you see the ridge that connects the, 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 the caspers side to side, it is not very, very sharp. On the other side, on the other hand, if you see on the lateral, on the, on the side, uh, you see a little bit of, of narrowing the caspers towards each other. So these caspers are becoming relatively closer. So what this uh, means is that uh, it, the, the tooth is forming a basal uh, flaring, which means very uh, relatively broad at the bottom and narrower at the top. For colobines, we uh, this is of course relatively smaller size specimen, but they have generally uh, smaller snouts, and uh, this pillar, the interorbital pillar, uh, interorbital pillar is relatively broad. When it comes to their dentition, if we see the, the front teeth, they have very narrow and smaller uh, incisors or front teeth. Coming to the uh, molars, the back uh, teeth, the cusps are prominently high. There is a high cusp relief. They are very sharp and high. And the crust connecting the, the cusps is, is uh, relatively sharp. And when we see on the side, unlike the circle of the signs, they show like a, a straight side. So what this means is the uh, proximity of the tip of the cusps is, uh, uh, is, is not very close compared to circle of the signs. So based on this, I will, I will give you uh, a mystery specimen so that you can, you can identify whether this specimen is a colobine or a suck up the sign like what we do in the field. So it's time to bust out your new tooth identification skills. Uh, for those of you viewing live in the audience, um, you will look for the three features that Highlight just taught us and tell us your assessment of what it is. Is it a, is the mystery tooth a colobine tooth or a cercopithecine tooth? please post your identification in the comments now and Haile will go over the, um, the differences one last time as we're, as we're waiting for responses to come in.
<laughs> Do you want to um, put the um, put the uh, tooth back up j just for a few more moments, just so we can? Yeah, perfect. Do you want to review some of the some of the features to help our audience guess? Oh uh, yeah, uh, the the ridges that connect the two cuspids and uh, the height of the cuspids, the relative the cusp relief, and uh, the proximity of the cuspids, how close they are to each other. The the the, the cuspids uh, placed side to side, and we have also an incisor here, so uh, we can also uh, talk about the size of the incisor and uh, and yeah flaring uh, cusp height and uh, ridge connecting the cuspids in the incisor size. Oh, we're starting to get some of the um, some of the assessments in. Uh, we have one vote for colubine. Do we have some more? Uh, we have another vote for colubine. Ah, oh, a circopithecine. Another circopithecine. So, um, what is the correct answer for our uh, for our mystery um, for our mystery fossil? Yeah, this is a circopithecine. Uh, we can go over the features again. Uh, generally, this this incisor is slightly larger than the colobines, and when we see when we see the cusp height is not very high, like the, the, the feature we see in colobines. It's, it's slightly larger than the, the other specimen of Cerco, Cerco the sign, but still, still, still it's low. And when we see the ridge connecting the, the, the two cuspids placed side, side by side, it's not very sharp. And there is also a slight uh, uh, tilting of the, this cusp, so there is some sort of some sort of, uh, of, of uh, becoming a, a proximity of the tip of the cuspids. So uh, based on this, this specimen is a uh, sarcoptocyte. So after the initial assessment, what does it take to competently assess one individual fossil? Uh, this is, uh, as I have tried to mention earlier, what we do in the field in terms of identification is very tentative. Uh, there are reasons for this because uh, one of the important reasons is time. We don't have uh, so much time in the field to do the detailed identification and we, do, we don't also have other materials to compare with. Uh, so uh, most of the activities are like surveying, understanding the geology, so uh, identifying the potentials of fossil, fossil sites. So these are the most important things. But the detailed uh, study is usually done in the lab because uh, we have relatively sufficient time for making a com comparison of different specimens that, are, that, that have been already published by uh, other scholars. So uh, we pull out other comparative materials and we uh, lay them out on the table and we can compare their features against the specimen uh, that we have. So uh, the confident identification is done uh, uh, in the lab. Um, so we just learned to identify fossil monkeys and um, your doctoral thesis project is on fossil monkeys. Why is it that we are interested in fossil monkeys as uh, opposed to other animals? Yeah. Yeah, there are a, a, a number of reasons that I can say. In the first place, if we see the modern uh, monkeys, they are widely distributed in a very uh, broad geographical location. We find them in a very range of latitude uh, differences. We find them in the tropics, we find them in the temperate areas, and also we, fi we, we, we find them in a different uh, 
altitudinal differences. Some of them are present in lowlands, some of them are present at highlands, uh, like the Chalada baboon in Ethiopia, which is uh, uh, living in a very mountainous area. Uh, and uh, in terms of their climatic uh, zone distribution, we find them in the tropical rainforest, we find them in the savanna environment, we also find them in the desert. So what this means is we have a chance to, uh, to, to understand the modern analog so that we can compare with our uh, fossil uh, monkey faunas. And the other uh, reason is they are, of course, relatively uh, closer in terms of phylogenetic relationship to early to, to humans. And not only this, uh, uh, fossil monkeys are very abundant in the fossil record in, in many in many sites, including Waran Somile, where I'm doing my dissertation project. So there are good uh, uh, sources of information to understand uh, early human evolution and also to understand the evolution of the, this fauna themselves. And uh, if we see, according to uh, uh, some studies, they have both uh, early humans and uh, all world fossil monkeys started to uh, expand their dietary adaptation at about similar time. So what this means is uh, they, uh, they, they uh, adapted to uh, a changing environment in a similar fashion. And there are also studies that show that uh, early humans and uh, uh, fossil monkeys compete for a similar or, or consume at least uh, uh, a similar type of diet. For instance, Paranthropos boisei and uh, Theropteus lineage. And the other uh, important point to mention here is uh, uh, monkeys have been used for decades as an important model to understand the evolution of early humans. And uh, they are also uh, being used to, uh, to understand the paleo environment. Like I have mentioned earlier, uh, colobine, because of the high abundance of colobines at Aramis, people argue that uh, that area where uh, Ardiptecus ramidus lived was mainly a wooded, a wooded environment. So there are a, a bunch of reasons why this uh, faunal group are very important to understand uh, evolution and uh, environment of early humans. I um, I am really really excited for this next part because um, I really love the way you frame your current research project. Um, could you tell us about about what you've got going on right now? Yeah, uh, the, let me start with the title of my project. It is uh, PLA ecological reconstruction of early humans uh, at Waran Somile using uh, fossil monkeys. So that's uh, uh, the title of the dissertation project that I'm working on. So Waran Somile is located uh, in the northeastern part of Ethiopia, very close to other famous research sites. Compared to the other sites, it's located a bit north, uh, uh, in, in, a bit north compared to other, other sites. So when we see uh, this, the contribution of this site, as you can see in the uh, next slide, uh, as you can see in this slide, sorry, uh, we have different important early human remains that are uh, discovered from Hadar, like uh, for instance, Lucy, and uh, we have also other uh, human remains discovered from Maka, Middle Awash, and we have also uh, another important uh, baby early human remain, which was discovered from uh, the Kika. And the name of this uh, uh, human remains is Salam. And we also have Kadanumu, uh, that's uh, another important early human remains discovered from Uran Somile at about 3.57 million years ago. So what this all individuals uh, tells us that, uh, uh, they, they, they belong to one species. So uh, it, it looks like there was an assumption that between 3.6 to 3 million years ago, uh, there was only a single species of early humans in the upper region. However, this was challenged due to the discovery of, uh, of other specimens from Ransomile. For instance, uh, an important discovery was announced uh, in 2012 uh, to, to show that there was a, a specimen, a partial foot specimen 
mainly called the Bortelli foot. So this specimen is not uh, uh, well affiliated with a specific taxonomic species, but it has a very important information in terms of understanding the uh, bipedal locomotion. So I have included uh, a footprint, which is uh, uh, reported from Lightoli, and this tells us that uh, there was a sort of uh, uh, bipedal locomotion closer to, uh, to humans, not exactly like humans, but uh, like cr closer to human uh, way of moving on two legs. But what this, this uh, uh, partial foot tells us that there was at least, uh, there was a multiple of bipedal locomotion at about uh, 3.6 to 3 million time range. Actually, this was discovered from 3.4 million uh, fossil horizon. Uh, so this is very important because it tells us the presence of multiple bipedal locomotion. And later discovery also suggested that there was really uh, additional uh, early human species in the upper region. And this was also discovered from Oranso Mille, from 3.3-ish, uh, 3.3 uh, 3 .3, uh, million years ago. <clears throat> and the uh, taxonomic or the species name for this uh, group of uh, specimens is Australopithecus uh, deiremeda. So overall, we have Australopithecus afarensis and we also have Australopithecus deiremeda, and this means we have at least more than one uh, early human species in the upper region. So the diverse, there, there is clear that uh, based on these discoveries, there was a diverse hominin species at, uh, or early human species at Waransomile, but not in the other areas. Although they are geographically closer, uh, although they are, uh, relatively or contemporaneous in terms of their uh, geological age. So this triggers a very important ecological question. Was there a, uh, the environment of uh, Waransomile, especially at 3.5 to 3.3 million uh, distinctive? Was, was the Waransomile uh, distinct in its environment compared to other, other uh, uh, sites which are very close uh, to, to Waransomile? So this was why I want to investigate. So for this, I, I, I picked uh, fossil monkeys for the reasons that I have mentioned earlier. And uh, I have uh, framed on, uh, a method how to, to, to address the research question. So the first thing is uh, I'll, I'll describe what's out there and uh, identify what or how many uh, fossil monkey species do we have at Waransomile in that uh, time range? And I will also uh, understand the uh, relative abundance and compare the sites. Is Waransomile having high abundance of a certain species of fossil monkeys compared to, to uh, the fossil monkeys present at other sites like Hadar, Dikika, uh, Maka? And uh, I will also have uh, a method to understand the diet of, of these fossil monkeys. One is understanding their dental uh, functional morphology or uh, correlating the diet and uh, 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 dental, the dental indices or the tooth measurement. So I'll, I'll able to know uh, which one is, is uh, having a more predictive power to understand the type of diet that they were eating. And uh, the other method is isotopic method. So isotope method, met, uh, method is extracting uh, uh, isotope uh, or understanding isotope signatures from uh, their tooth enamel so that uh, understand what actually those uh, fossil faunas were eating. So that uh, comparing the different sites, if uh, the fossil faunas of Ransomilia were more of a C3 eater or a C4 eater, compared to other other sites. Well, thank you so much, Haile. Um, we'll have to have you back when you get your research results. Um, now we have some questions from the audience for you. Uh, I know we have one. Ah, so um, how, why did Haile decide to pursue this special area of study? Uh, 
I think the first thing is uh, the, I, I have seen the importance of fossil monkeys in understanding uh, uh, the evolution of early human ancestors. Of course, I have done my master's uh, thesis on, on pigs, but uh, when I see the, the uh, relatively closer uh, phylogenetic proximity of fossil monkeys to hominins, that's, that, that gives me uh, more comfort to work on, on fossil primates so that I can, uh, I can uh, uh, clearly understand how, how humans uh, evolve over time. So that's, uh, that's one, one important reason. And of course, the other reasons I have mentioned earlier are also important because uh, fossil monkeys are important in, 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 in several ways. Do we have a, do we have, oh, here we go. Um, how can we apply the past paleo environmental information and knowledge to rehabituate and restore the current degraded ecosystem? That's a very broad uh, question. And uh, I'm not, I'm not very sure to say this, this, this way. But there are, uh, there are some important lessons that we can take from the previous uh, environment. We, we have seen that, as I have uh, tried to, sh to display in one of my, my slides, environments have been changing over time. So, uh, so we, we, uh, we can get a lesson that the current environment is of course changing, but uh, it will also continue to change. But uh, I, I don't really know, uh, uh, the exact way of, of, of taking uh, or, or using that for a rehabilitation of this environment. Yeah, and I, I feel like also, you know, environments do change over time. So you may not, it may not make the most sense to try to return an environment to the way it was. Do we have, do we have another question? Nope. Oh. How can carbonate help us to reconstruct past environments? Uh, for this, I, I'm not exactly doing on carbonates, but uh, the the, <clears throat> the way we uh, we use them is in a similar uh, approach that we use understanding paleo environment from uh, to to inamin. So the carbonates are uh, <clears throat> produced from the uh, uh, plant remains over time. So uh, the plants could be big trees or or, or grasses so that the isotope signature that we get from this paleo, uh, uh, paleo soil carbonates tells us that the type of, of plants that were uh, present at, at, at a certain area in a certain, uh, in a specific time. So I think we have one more question. Is there any evidence that the monkeys were consumed by these hum hominin species? That's a very interesting question and I have been uh, discussing this uh, with my advisor. Uh, there are some, I think from Oler Gasale, there was uh, some uh, cut mark or, or uh, human touched uh, mark on a monkey skull. So there is a, a, an assumption that uh, how many, uh, early human ancestors might have, might have been eating uh, monkeys, but uh, there is no very intensive so far I know there is a very intensive uh, research that shows early human ancestors were uh, in some part dependent for their food on, on, on monkeys. Now we're, we're almost out of time, um, but I do have one final question for you. Um, if, if you could answer it somewhat quickly. Um, you have another uh, really strong passion for building the facilities for studying human evolution in Ethiopia. Could you talk a little bit about that passion? Yeah, uh, that's a very good, good uh, uh, question, a little bit away from the research side. So uh, there is one, one important thing that uh, Ethiopia is uh, uh, one of the countries being rivaled by very few countries in terms of uh, the potential to, uh, pro to provide the understanding of early human, human evolution. But when we see the contribution or the involvement of research uh, uh, in Ethiopian institution, it's very minimal. 
there are of course some uh, famous uh, Ethiopian scholars who are uh, uh, working hard in this area, but uh, coming to the uh, involvement of Ethiopian is institutions is very limited. So I have uh, uh, an interest to at least to build capacity in one of the institutions, ma mainly the uh, already established institution at Mali University, which is uh, dedicated to uh, or established to work on on human evolution and understanding of the paleo environment or the environment of early human ancestors. So uh, it, I'm, I'm really interested to, to uh, build the capacity of that institution and have a better involvement of the that institution and uh, do research in human evolution and paleo environment. Well, Hila, we are just, I'm so happy that you could join us today. We want to really thank you. Um, this was a really fascinating talk. Thank you for having me. Uh, for those of you watching, um, you can visit the Leakey Foundation at leakeyfoundation.org to learn more about the Leakey Foundation, Hila Reda, and how you can support research like Hila's and educational programs like Lunch Break Science. Right now, all donations will be doubled by two generous donors, meaning your impact will be doubled. Next Thursday, we meet Leaky Foundation scientist Dan Lieberman and learn about what evolution tells us about the immune system. Be sure to subscribe to the Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up for our newsletter to be the first to hear about upcoming episodes and groundbreaking discoveries in human evolution. Still hungry for science and can't wait till next week? Check out the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast, Origin Stories, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Lunch Break Science is made possible by the generous support of Anne and Gordon Getty and Camilla and George Smith. Thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next week, stay hungry for knowledge. <laughs>